Good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting in 2019 of the Health and Sport Committee. Please ask everyone in the room to ensure mobile phones are off or on silent and that they are not used for photography or recording proceedings. We have received apologies this morning from David Torrance. The first item on the agenda is subordinate legislation, consideration of an affirmative instrument. As is usual in these matters, we will, have, we will hear first from the Cabinet Secretary and her officials on the instrument. Once uh, uh, all questions raised by members have been answered, we will then move to a formal debate on the motion. The instrument we are looking at today is the Community Care, Personal Care and Nursing Care Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019 in draft. And I welcome to the committee Jean Freeman, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Mike Liddell uh, from the Adult Social Care Policy uh, Unit and Anne Matthey from the Legal Directorate of the Scottish Government. Welcome. And Cabinet Secretary, I believe you would uh, offer us a brief opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, convener, and good morning to you and members. Uh, I'm grateful to you for the opportunity to speak briefly about these amending regulations. The draft affirmative order before the committee uh, reflects our continued intention to increase free personal and nursing care payments in line with inflation. The order, if approved, will continue to benefit self-funding adults resident in care homes. The rates are calculated using the GDP deflator inflation tool, which this year um, produces an increase of 1.57%. This would mean the weekly payment for personal care will rise from £174 to £177, and the nursing care component will rise from £79 to £80 per week. The committee will be aware that from the 1st of April, our policy of free personal care will extend to under 65s uh, and the weekly payment rates will be the same for both over and under 65 year olds. It is estimated that this rise will cost 1.9 million and this includes the estimated costs for self-funders under the age of 65 following the extension of free personal care. As part of our 2019-2020 draft budget, £160 million uh, will be transferred from the health portfolio to local authorities uh, in year investment for investment in integration, including delivery of the living wage, uh, operating free personal care and extending it to under 65s and school counselling services. Uh, I'm happy, convener, to take any questions on the regulations. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. David Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary and officials. Could I ask a technical question, and I generally don't know the answer to this. Um, measures of inflation are really very important, and obviously I'm aware of the GDP inflator, which, as you say, is 1.57%. I was just wondering what room for manoeuvre uh, you had, Cabinet Secretary, on this, because if you jump to the next piece of legislation, you'll see that there's other measures of inflation. Uh, consumer price index is 24 and if you look at the average earnings, it's 2.7. So uh, basically, inflation depends on the measure that you decide that you're measuring. And I know from my work on pension committee, for example, that there's a big issue in the long term according to the measure of inflation that you determine. Did you have any room for manoeuvre on whether you use the GDP deflator, or could you have used some other measure of inflation? So the, the GDP deflator is still the standard measure uh, used for inflation in the Scottish Government uh, <clears throat> and is used for creating real-time comparisons. If you look, for example, at the carer's allowance um, using CPI to operate uh, free personal and nursing care would uh, increase uh, the £174 payment to £178, but it would... Uh, uh, decrease uh, the, uh, and also increase the 79 to 81 uh, for nursing care. So there are variations, but as ter in terms of uh, the overall uh, standard usage in Scottish Government, it is the GDP deflator, and that uh, final decision about uh, what we will use uh, sits with the Finance Secretary. And I mean, obviously we're not at the next item yet, uh, Convener, but obviously in the next item you're looking at a different measure. You're looking at CPI and then average earnings, which give you different results. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from members? Uh, if not, we will move to agenda item two, which is the formal debate on the affirmative instrument on which we have just heard from the Cabinet Secretary. I remind colleagues that uh, members... Uh, 
should not put questions to the minister during the formal debate, or nor uh, in particular to officials. Um, and I would invite the minister to move the motion S five M one five seven five two. I move. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Are there any contributions to the debate from colleagues? If there are none, uh, I would therefore invite the Cabinet Secretary, if there's anything you wish to say before we move to a decision on the matter, feel free uh, to do the, so. <clears throat> uh, the, the only thing to say, of course, um, uh, convener, is that all of this is, of course, dependent on Parliament approving uh, the 2019-20 budget later Indeed. this week. Thank you very much. The question, therefore, is that the motion S5M15752 be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed? That is agreed. Thank you very much. We now move on to uh, consideration of uh, two negative instruments. The first is the National Assistance Assessment of Resources Amendment Scotland Regulations 2019. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on this instrument. Are there any comments from members? If there are none, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? That is agreed. Thank you very much. The second negative instrument is the National Assistance Sums for Personal Requirements Scotland Regulations 2019. Again, there has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on this instrument. Are there any comments from members? If there are none, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? That is agreed. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we'll suspend briefly to allow a change of officials at the table. Uh, we will now resume. The next item on the agenda is an evidence session on the Ministerial Strategic Group for Health and Community Care report. This session will inform the Committee's ongoing interest and focus on the delivery of integration. Can I welcome again to the Committee, Jean Freeman, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. Can I welcome Malcolm Wright, Director General Health and Social Care and Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, Having uh, worked with Malcolm in other roles, uh, I congratulate him on his appointment and welcome him to his first meeting of the committee in his new role. And I welcome uh, Councillor Stuart Curry, spokesperson for health and social care with COSLA, uh, John Wood, the chief officer for health and social care with COSLA, and Alison Taylor, head of integration division in the Scottish Government. And uh, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short introductory statement on behalf of the Ministerial Strategic Group? Thank, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I am grateful to you for inviting Councillor Curry uh, and me to give evidence today on behalf of the Ministerial Strategic Group on Health and Community Care about the review of progress with integration. The fact that we are here together today is, I believe, an excellent demonstration of the partnership working between Scottish Government, local government and the National Health Service, all of which, of course, underpins integration. The wider membership of the MSG, which we chair jointly, demonstrates the importance of sectors and professions across health and social care jointly committing to integration success. This work belongs to all members of the MSG, the statutory partners, the third and independent sectors, the professional bodies and the royal colleges who make up its membership. One of integration's defining characteristics is that we all agree it is vitally important. 
It's a necessary change to ensure our health and social care services keep pace with the evolving needs of Scotland's people. I won't rehearse our reasons for integrating now, and I know that members are very familiar with those. When I became Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport last year, I set out my top priorities, of which integration is one. And I said then that my focus was increasing the pace and the effectiveness of change. We now have evidence from the Audit Scotland report published in November that integration is beginning to work well in some local systems and having a real impact on people's experience of care, along with its quality and sustainability. This review of progress, jointly led by the Scottish Government and COSLA, provides us with an excellent vantage point for setting out our priorities for the next year or so. We know that challenges remain with properly and fully implementing integration. The review has sought particularly to identify barriers and to address these in its proposals. It is not a review that sets out high-level principles. All of that work has already been done for integration when we leg legislated and set up integration authorities. So the review is deliberately focused on practicalities. It includes some challenging timescales. To ensure its success, we will be drawing together and building upon existing work streams across health and social care, and in some instances, undertaking new work to reinforce progress. Councillor Curry and I, through the MSG, will be holding to account all of the contributors to progress, and we are pleased to take this opportunity to restate our shared commitment to making integration work. With that, convener, very happy uh, on our joint behalf to answer any questions members have. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And it, it does indeed seem that the, the report indicates uh, a, 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 a recognition of the need for perhaps increased pace and, and effectiveness in uh, going forward. Can I ask first, Jean Freeman, and, the, and secondly, Stuart Curry, what respectively the Scottish Government and COSLA see as your role in ensuring the implementation uh, of these recommendations? Well, you'll see, convener, um, from uh, the uh, review report itself, that we are very clear in uh, setting out what requires to happen and the timescales within which it happens, but also in setting out very clearly what we, uh, that is jointly COSLA and uh, Scottish Government, intend to do in order to provide that uh, very visible joint leadership uh, and the uh, group that was charged with undertaking the review has been commissioned by us to continue uh, as an oversight group to lead the implementation. Uh, the review itself was published on the 4th of April. Uh, from memory, the uh, group itself then met on the 11th, uh, 4th of February rather, then met on the 11th of February uh, and has drafted uh, an implementation plan that sets out very clearly what are the practical steps that need to be done? Uh, one of the things that Councillor Curry and I have discussed and we will uh, undertake uh, to do, uh, are, there are three elements to it. Uh, first of all, uh, to look at uh, embedding that partnership approach uh, by bringing uh, into Scottish Government to assist our joint work, uh, direct experience from a chief officer uh, and by uh, providing to COSLA an additional resource from Scottish Government to support their work in this area. Uh, the other element is to uh, make good use of the considerable expertise that exists in, in uh, the Health Directorate of Scottish Government, but also now in joint work with COSLA of the quality improvement methodology. Members will recall this as a significant um, methodological and practical approach that has produced our Scottish Patient Safety Programme, a Scottish-wide systemic improvement in patient safety sustained over 10 years now, and is an approach that has contributed to the children and young people collaborative work with, again, with local authorities. To you then use that resource uh, to help our integration authorities to themselves um, systematically and systemically improve their practice so that we share that good practice. Um, I think members will 
be familiar with me saying more than one occasion that I'm really not interested in learning from good practice, I'm interested in implementing good practice. But we need to give our uh, integration authorities some of the tools and the expertise that does exist between COSLA and ourselves so that they can do that in a very practical way. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, before I invite Stuart Curry to comment, you mentioned uh, an implementation plan which I think you said had been drafted last week or possibly agreed. Is that a plan that can be shared with the committee? Um, it can be shared with the committee once the Ministerial Strategic Group has itself seen it. Yep. Um, so at this point it is in draft stage. Uh, there will be some more work to be done uh, by that oversight group uh, to fill in some of the areas not yet completed. Uh, that will then come to the MSG, and as soon as uh, the MSG has approved it, very happy to share it with the committee. Thank you very much. That's appreciated. Councillor Curry. Well, thanks, uh, convener. I, mean, I think um, what's important is that we um, show that leadership that's required um, at a national level. I think that can be done and can only be done jointly. It's about working with our, our partners in the, the third and voluntary sector uh, as well to ensure that we all uh, understand uh, why it's so important that we work together to deliver. Um, but I think also it's about increasing that pace of integration. I think um, there's been a lot of discussions and a lot of um, reports over the, the past few years. I think there is an expectation, rightly so, um, about delivery. And it's important when you look at the timescales contained within the MSG uh, leadership uh, report, those uh, timescales are challenging. They're not, I don't think they pull any punches. I think it goes straight to the, the nub of many of the issues. Um, so those timescales are challenging, but it's important that we hold to account to ensure those challenges uh, are absolutely met, because to do anything other than that would be to um, well, not succeed as we would all want. Um, but also in terms of uh, best practice, I think it is important. Where, where we have evidence, uh, and there is evidence out there of best practice where things are working really well, then I think it's identifying those. It's making sure that we can see how can we use those uh, examples of best practice elsewhere. Um, and uh, if something can't work somewhere else, we should know why that is the case. Um, but where something can work somewhere else, we should look at that too. So it is about learning uh, best practice, uh, about making sure we have that uh, in a wider area. But, but I just emphasise the point that I think there's been a lot of discussion. There's been the Audit Scotland report. There's been this report. Um, I think there is a, a real expectation, rightly so, about delivery. And that's why these timescales, challenging as they are, must absolutely be um, uh, met to ensure we make progress. That's, that's good to hear from, from both the government and COSLA. Can, can I ask, again, both of you, uh, in terms of measuring the success of the proposals that are agreed in this report and also measuring the success of IAs in, in implementing this report in terms of outcomes? I wonder if you would like to comment both on how the, the success will be measured and how a delivery against outcomes will be measured in going forward. Um, thank you, convener. If, if I could uh, start with that, just for the benefit of the record, I should correct. The uh, oversight group met on the 12th of February, not the 11th, uh, and I have agreed to meet every six weeks, which I think is important uh, to indicate to the committee the seriousness with which we're taking both the work that needs to be done, but as Councillor Curry said, the challenge of the timescales uh, in that uh, we are determined that we will meet those timescales. Uh, in terms of uh, measuring um, uh, whether or not we, we are progressing as we require to progress, that will uh, be uh, included in the draft implementation plan. Um, uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, either from Scottish Government or indeed from uh, COSLA, um, uh, Mr Wood, may want to talk a little bit about the data that is already collected uh, and how we might triangulate that data a bit better in order to be able to measure across the whole system uh, how well integration is working. Because, of course, um, it isn't just uh, members may have uh, questions later on about the impact of uh, successful integration on, for example, delayed discharge. Um, so you, you can't measure the success of integrated health and social care as a kind of standalone without looking at what are the comparable measurements that feed into that from, for example, performance in, in health as well as performance uh, elsewhere in, in local authority services. But we have had, uh, Councillor Curry and I, uh, productive discussions about what those successful milestones and measurements might be without requiring um, significant additional 
data collection on the part of integration authorities. We need them to get on and deliver the services and not have an, an additional uh, unnecessary element of data collection. So the work uh, of the oversight group and the officials working to that from both COSLA and Scottish Government will be looking at the data that we currently have and how that can be triangulated, as I said, most effectively to demonstrate progress or not. Uh, and of course, Councillor Curry and I are very keen to know uh, in a very um, uh, timious way how progress is being uh, delivered, because if it is not, then we need to look at what further interventions we might jointly want to take to ensure that progress is being met against those timescales. I don't know if, if you want to add in, Mr. Yeah, just, I mean, briefly, I'd ask uh, Mr. Wood just to comment some of the data uh, areas, but I think, I think it is important that where there are concerns or where there are issues or where things maybe aren't working is, has been, had been envisaged, then we don't just wait eh, or nobody waits for a report to come out eh, some period in the future to tell us eh, what we potentially already know and we can help with that. The other thing is it's about providing support and, um, eh, and, and knowledge and support eh, and leadership skills and practice across the board. It's not just about saying that um, we know everything at the centre. But I do think that where there are areas where we can assist in terms of resource or discussions or uh, bringing people together to discuss these matters, then that seems to be a helpful way forward. Uh, but I'll maybe ask Mr Wood just to comment some of the areas around data and how we measure. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. So I guess um, in, in terms of the answering the question, how, how are we going to measure success from this? I suppose it works at a national level and at a local level as well. So. Um, national data is received by the MSG. We've agreed six um, outcomes, uh, sorry, sorry, indicators that the MSG receives regular reports on. So, as Ms. Freeman says, that data will be triangulated against um, the, su the success that uh, that we hope to achieve. There are also the 23 integration indicators that IGBs report against, and all of that information uh, will, will give us a picture. But of course. Um, there's, a, there's a certain time lag to that, um, and with regards to measuring success against um, the implementation plan that we're setting out as a result of this um, review of progress, integration joint boards will also be taking this report and benchmarking their own progress and their own activity, essentially, against some of the, the, some of the actions and some of the asks that are contained within that, um, and we, we expect that to be, um, to be, I guess, reported into the leadership group on a, on a regular on a regular basis, but most importantly, it will be picked up in the in the annual reports that the IGBs produce. Okay, thank you very much. Brief supplementary from Sandra Hart. Thank you, thank you very much, Kavina. Good morning. I was very interested, uh, Councillor Curry, when you mentioned about the third and voluntary sector, very important. And one of the areas I did want to raise was the alcohol and drug initiatives uh, and regarding the implementation plan and as uh, Mr Woods had said about you know, getting the outcomes and information, having visited, as most of the committee have done, uh, all the partnerships in the area to do with uh, alcohol and drug uh, abuse, unfortunately, uh, they have outcomes. Will that be fed into the implementation plan? You know, the, the outcomes and the figures that they have, will that be fed through the IGBs and then into the implementation plan? Uh, <coughs> Alison Taylor. Convener, thank you. Um, those measures we would certainly expect to form part of the local plans for improvement. And uh, Mr. Woods described that we take a high level, high, a small number of, of really key indicators to the ministerial group. And I think the thing here is to make sure that we interleave that which is important in the local system into what we look at across the piece. But alcohol and drug interventions are of considerable importance, and it would obviously be for the chairs of the ministerial group to decide if they wish to take a particular look at a specific subject at any meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Emma Hopper. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm interested in the issues around collaborative leadership and building relationships. And, uh, and Stuart Curry, you talked about achieving best practice. And I know that health and social care integration requires lots of people working together to develop teams and then share good practice across boards and regions. And, and I know some of the processes can take a while to, to achieve, but I'm interested in some of the issues around leadership and how the Scottish Government and COSLA can ensure that there is appropriate leadership in place to de deliver continuity and then support the services and delivery and ultimately integration. So, um, 
it is a really important point, and actually the ministerial uh, group that uh, looked at the and approved uh, the final report from uh, the review, there was quite a lot of discussion uh, around leadership. Um, and one of the things that was uh, noticeable about that discussion was that uh, each of the different partners, if you like, to integration um, undertook their own leadership programmes. Uh, and what was uh, evident from the discussion was that what we needed to have was uh, almost a single leadership programme that uh, brought all of those parties together, whether that was at chief officer level with uh, partners in health boards and local authorities, uh, or finance officers, or so on. Um, and so part of what is uh, proposed is that all leadership development will be focused on shared and collaborative practice, whether that is leadership development inside the health service for clinicians or others, whether it is leadership development inside uh, local authorities, or whether it is joint in terms of uh, the integration work. Um, it's one, it was one of those moments, I think, when uh, all of us realised that there were parts of our own practice that were not sufficiently integrated uh, when we, uh, that is essential to underpin the overall drive for integration. But I'm going to ask Mr Wright uh, to pick up on some of that too, if I may. Welcome back. Yes, and I, I think the whole leadership piece is absolutely pivotal. And I think if we get the leadership work right, then a lot of these other actions within the action plan, delivery plan will, will, will fall into place. Uh, and it seems to me we need to be tackling this at, at different levels. There's maybe a range of some of the national programmes that are currently underway, uh, be it in the health service, be it in the um, improvement service. Uh, how can we bring some of those programmes together? So looking at some of the NHS national bodies and how they work with the improvement service, how can we pull that together? And critically, I think in local systems, uh, most local systems have got leadership programmes of one form or another uh, running. And I think it'll be important to see if we can bring those together at a, at a local level. Because for me, the how we support the chairs and the vice chairs of, of the IJBs, how we support the chief officers, the chief financial officers, how we support the senior teams, and pivotally, how we support uh, practitioners working together on the ground, delivering care into people's communities and to people's homes, is, is really the most important thing. I think the second thing I, I, I would add would be the importance of working relationships at the most senior level. And certainly my experience within uh, the health service working in, in different boards, when, the, when those relationships between the health board chief executive, the local authority chief executive, and the IJB chief officer are working well, then a lot of these improvements can flow. If those relationships are not working well, that's where we, we tend to see some of, some of the challenges. So how those relationships are working well, and also how the chair of the health board, the non-executives on the health board, are working collaboratively with the conveners and leaders of the council. So there's really quite um, a big bit of work to do to make sure that we're covering that at all of the different levels. And my sense of it, reading the, um, the, the draft plan, and I can talk a little bit about how the meeting went and some of the areas that, that we covered in that, there was a strong sense that when we get into some of the more technical but important issues like uh, set-aside budgets, um, if we get the quality of relationships and leadership right at the most senior level, actually these are technical issues which we can uh, help to happen and make sure that we get those shifts in not only in resource but in terms of where people are cared for uh, much more towards their homes and within their local communities. So I hope that helps. Um, uh, convene in terms of the uh, importance of leadership and what we intend to do about that. Thank you very much. Stuart Curry. Yeah, thanks, uh, convener. I think I think what's crucial is about um, that kind of mutual understanding of uh, where everybody comes from. I think um, obviously there's been two well, a huge shift in terms of integration from uh, the health service and local government coming together, and it's really important that people work together. And I think the importance of a joint approach to things like leadership uh, and leadership work is to ensure that um, integration doesn't just stop when the meeting finishes. Integration is something that is, is just part of the day-to-day -day activities. It's no different, you know, you, you walk down a corridor in the building, you're speaking to someone, you shouldn't know whether someone 
was formerly from the health service or formerly from local government. Um, we, you know, we should have different uh, lanyards. You know, you, you know, you shouldn't have this thing where uh, people can spot that that's a health service person or local government. It should be clear that you're dealing with integration of health and social care. That is that is the point of it. So I think leadership, I think, is important when people meet out with formal meetings. They're talking about integration. They're discussing integration. Uh, they're gossiping about integration. That integration is the sole focus of the work that goes on. I think that's really important. But it is, and obviously one of the major recommendations isn't just about leadership, it's about building relationships. Uh, and that goes beyond um, the confines of a, you know, a council or an NHS building. Um, it's with uh, the third sector and the, the voluntary sector, because actually this whole system approach is crucial, because I don't think any one part of the, the former system can deliver on its own. I think only these different systems coming together, that whole system approach, uh, will deliver health and social care integration as we all want it to work. Uh, but it's absolutely crucial uh, that when people are discussing matters that we understand it is about integration, not just at formal meetings, but throughout everything we do. And if we do that, uh, whilst there will still be the challenges and there will still be the, the issues and, and people have concerns, nevertheless, I think we'll be in a far better place to meet those challenges and concerns as we go forward. Can I just say what, one That's additional good. thing, if I may convene? I think, <clears throat> I think it is only fair for us to recognise that, um, as uh, both Councillor Curry and Mr Wright have said, that what we are doing here is we are bringing together different cultures over decades and different, consequently different operating styles uh, and expectations. Now, there are a lot of similarities, but there are significant differences. So the real challenge is actually to both uh, our NHS and to our local authorities to recognise that a different cultural uh, approach is required. Um, now, we have experience of uh, helping people to fear that less than they might otherwise do and see the gains. The, the real uh, trick, if you like, in this uh, review report will be to... Uh, jointly to at, at the same time produce uh, tangible improvements in service delivery in a consistent way across the, the country uh, in order to back up the requirement that we have together on those cultures to make changes uh, to those relationships. Now, Audit Scotland set out very clearly that it was about relationships. We didn't need to uh, alter legislation and there were no issues in terms of the clarity of governance. Where there may be some issues, and this stems from different cultures, is around the understanding of that clarity. So part of what we have to do, and uh, it will be a significant role for both Councillor Curry and, and myself, is to help ensure that we lead this in such a way that that is really clear. It's clear in the letter of the law and it's clear uh, in guidance, but it's not necessarily clear in people's minds. Exactly so. Okay. Emma Harper. Just to pick up the point about uh, um, culture and different people, we've got allied health professionals, multidisciplinary teams across health and social care. And I'm a former NHS employee myself, and I've witnessed that change can take an awfully long time. And uh, I think one thing that was raised with me was the different language that's used between local authorities and then health care in that uh, we need to speak a national common language for health and social care integration. So leadership collaboration would focus on that and support that. And I, I guess my final my question would be then how do we expect integration authorities to ensure that the multidisciplinary team, the social workers, the allied health professionals are all part of that discussion using the same language? So there, there is, um, I think there are limitations to using the same language, if I'm honest. But I think what's really important is that people understand what each other means. And the way you do that is through that joint leadership and collaboration. Uh, so that you understand better the particular requirements and pressures of a colleague's job compared to yours and their yours, and therefore you can work better together. And I think one of the things that's noticeable uh, at the moment in terms of uh, integration is that at a, at a delivery team level, uh, oftentimes people are just getting on with it. It makes perfect sense to them. 
that they're delivering health care alongside allied professionals, alongside social work and social care. That makes perfect sense because they are closest to the individual who requires and is receiving that care, and it makes sense to them that it should come from more than one place. Um, what we need to ensure is that that uh, sensible understanding of what is needed is understood at all the other levels in terms of integration, um, inside boards, inside local authorities, and uh, at the IJB level itself. Um, but one of the specific recommendations uh, in the review is about how uh, we will assist integration authorities to engage better with uh, their local communities and with uh, those who represent uh, local communities. Um, so we're part of the uh, delivery plan will be to look at how we might do that. And of course, that has, as we've discussed in this committee before, a resonance with uh, how well or otherwise uh, our health boards engage with their local communities in terms of persistent and consistent engagement and not just when something big is about to happen. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Alex Cole Hamilton. Bina, good morning, Cabinet. It's actually good morning to your colleagues as well. Um, I'd like to expand this issue around leadership. And um, one of the things we picked up is the slightly worrying churn in the uh, higher end of the leadership within IJBs. Um, some 57% of uh, senior managers have uh, changed since the project started. And indeed, that happened in, in Edinburgh. We had a change of chief officer um, quite early on in my term as an MSP. And I work closely with uh, the, the chief officers of IJBs, as I'm sure all parliamentarians do, because we, we have cases which uh, come into that universe. And I've always been struck with the high calibre that we attract in those roles. So if, the, if they are talented individuals and they've got the right skill set, why are they leaving? Is this uh, because the project is ungovernable or because the, the expectations are too high? What, what is the reason for this chain? Well, I'll, I'll give you my view. Um, I haven't conducted a survey about it. Um, but my view is that uh, integration is relatively young and new, and that for some individuals, uh, <clears throat> it may not have been uh, the experience that they expected it to be. Uh, and I think in those circumstances, it is entirely sensible for, the, for them as individuals and indeed for the wider project of integration, for people to seek uh, roles elsewhere. If the job's not the right job for you, then uh, if it's at all possible, the best thing to do is to uh, go elsewhere to a job in an environment that works for you. Um, so I, my own view would be that that is in part uh, at least what has happened, and I don't see anything uh, troublesome about that or to be worried about that. I think that we have... Um, uh, a very good, overall very good group of chief officers, um, just as I believe we have uh, a talented and able uh, group of senior officers in local authorities and in the health service. Um, but, but people need to move into what is this new world uh, of integration and uh, to do that in their heads as well as in their practice, uh, which is part, I think, what Mr Wright is referring to and other colleagues about um, the importance of leadership and shared and collaborative leadership support and training so that people can be helped to do that. Too often, when change comes our way, we are understandably fearful of that. Um, but actually, with the right support, we can discover that our role is much enhanced in that in different environment than it was before and much more rewarding than it was before. And I think that, that what we are seeing is almost... Um, the inevitable right, uh, flow as a, a new idea creates itself, embeds itself, and now needs to move on and deliver much more systematically and sustainably. But I don't know, Mr. Wright or Councillor Curry may want to say anything about that. Yeah, th thanks, Camina. I think I mean I, I'm I'm not I'm not certain that the the turnover is uh, necessarily massively different from what we've experienced in the past. Certainly. Um, uh, before uh, we had integration, I certainly remember as a councillor uh, a number of uh, senior people in uh, health and indeed uh, local government moving on. Um, I, I think sometimes, though, I think when something's new and it is 
relatively new, um, there's a point and there's a period where people make a decision whether it's for them, right for them, um, going forward. And, and if it's not, sometimes people move on. Uh, but what I do know is when uh, roles are advertised, uh, I'm not aware that there's a shortage of people coming forward. And that's good uh, in terms of that kind of competitive uh, recruitment. Um, because I think people do see it as the opportunity to do something uh, new, something quite exciting, uh, and, and actually to deliver better outcomes for um, the people that they, they seek to serve. And I think that's, that's encouraging. Uh, obviously, time will tell, but I, but I do think in any organisation, when there's the bringing together of two um, huge organisations in health and social care, there are going to be people who will decide it's not for them. And that's absolutely fine. That happens all the time. But I do think it's important that when recruitment is undertaken for chief officers and a whole range of other officers, um, that um, we, we ensure that we get the best uh, possible people uh, in there to do the job and people who know what the challenges are and are excited about those challenges and, and, and want to meet them. It's also important to recognise that these jobs are changing and have changed. So um, when integration was first established, chief officers were appointed. There was a lot of work in terms of getting the integration authorities actually established in, in law, setting up the statutory body and starting to make you know rapid improvements as a as a as a new body on what's all, you know already a, a complex landscape. And I think that the report that's been published signals a step change in the pace of integration. And my sense of um, working with the chief officers is, as the Cabinet Secretary says, I think we've got a good group of chief officers in Scotland. My sense is that they're up for this challenging change and there are lots of challenges in it. And I think between Scottish Government and local authorities and the IGB boards themselves, how we support the chief officers to deliver in that very demanding uh, landscape. And, and certainly the leadership group that supports the ministerial group um, that is co-chaired by myself and Sally Loudon, I think that also is a very important signal that Scottish Government uh, and COSLA Health and local authorities are going to work together to support the chief officers in what are hugely challenging uh, positions, and I, I think, um, as I said before, this is a this report is, it signals a step change in how we want to drive the pace and and the scale of integration. And I think the role of the chief officers, and of course the report also mentions the section 95 officers, mentions the chairs and the vice chairs of the IJB. We really do need to get behind uh, our, our folks and and really support them. And as the Cabinet Secretary says, um, there will inevitably be a turnover of chief officers as the job evolves. Uh, and I'm not seeing a, a shortage of people who are keen to take on, on these challenges. So I think we get four square behind our chief officers. Thank you very much. I'll recall. I'm grateful for that response. It is encouraging to hear that we still have healthy competition for these roles. Um, the cabinet has actually described the IJB, uh, sorry, the integration as a, a new world, and I share that vision. And I think that speaks to a, a shared ambition to move from that more siloed culture where we were thinking about acute care and then social care in the community as two separate complete entities and people were very protective over budgets and things like that, to something where there's a, a lot more fluidity and flow, as you describe, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, my concern, though, is that there is still a disconnect there, that it, we are still failing in that regard. And I often raise the example of my constituent who spent 150 nights in the Liberton Hospital after the point at which he was declared fit to go home because of uh, a, a, sm a minor... Um, addition that he needed to a care package that nobody could find provision for. So he was spending, let's say, £400 a night in the Liberton Hospital, whereas an £80 a night care package would have seen him home. Why is that still happening? So the, the f two things to say at the outset. First of all, uh, I would share your view that um, that should not happen. And um, that would be our intention that that would not continue to happen. Um, secondly, I, I need to say that uh, bed days lost and delays continue to decline, albeit not at the pace that any of us in this room wish. Um, what we see is across our integration authorities a mixed picture uh, of uh, some uh, who are managing uh, successfully to significantly reduce the volume of delayed discharge in their respective boards um, with care at home and with packages and so on, uh, and others who are being 
uh, significantly less successful for differing reasons. So you're, you're sitting beside Mr Briggs and you will know yourself, you've both raised this with me, the particular issues in and around the city of Edinburgh that are in part, I, I wouldn't accept totally, but are in part a product of the local economy here and the competitiveness of employment and wage rates and so on and so forth. And as you both know, both the integration, uh, both the local authority and the health board have contributed additional funds to try and address at least some of that. And I think we've seen uh, some um, improvement in that situation. Um, but part of what we're trying to address in this report with those tight timescales and with that delivery plan and that six weekly meeting of the oversight group reporting to Councillor Curry and I, and, and I hope we are um, continuing to uh, assure you of our uh, absolute shared personal commitment to delivering on this, on these uh, actions, is moving towards a position where we see fewer and fewer of those situations like your constituent. And that disparity across the country between uh, different uh, integration authorities in terms of uh, what they are successfully achieving is uh, significantly reduced over the coming year. That's the intent, is to um, that's what we mean when we talk about implementing good practice. Now, not every bit of good practice in those integration authorities that are doing well in this area uh, is applicable directly over to those who are more challenged by it, but there undoubtedly will be elements that are applicable. So if you then uh, recognise that and you take the quality improvement methodology, it's a very practical set of tools, then you give people the tools to lift the relevant good practice and apply it without having to reinvent the wheel. So there's, there's more than one strand here, all of which is aimed at combining to get those exactly the kind of results that you're referring to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, George Adam. Thank you, Gavina. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and Councillor Curry. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Cabinet Secretary, about the, it's a new world. You know, uh, and is it not the case when you're talking about leadership and uh, the culture that we're having to deal with in local government and various other bodies as well as that's a major step. But they need to they need to be part of that vision. They need to be involved in it. I'm a former councillor myself. I've seen it from both sides, and uh, not to be necessarily negative. Sometimes there can be some people in the in that cog that will be quite difficult not actually grab onto it and start thinking about their own traditional ways of working, as opposed to looking at this new vision and this new idea of trying to deliver uh, for the people that they serve. And is it not the case that we, we need to make sure that senior staff that are in a place where they can actually uh, work together in that way? Because that's quite difficult. You're talking about chief executives that you know have been so used to making their own decisions and moving forwards. You know, how do you get these personalities to all work together in one uh, kind of joint board? <laughs> It, it's a it's a very good question. Um, I think sometimes um, uh, uh, all of us, most of us, I certainly know that I would fit into this category, mistake uh, control over a number of things as equating to levels of authority and to your uh, leadership skills. Actually, good leadership skills very often uh, are demonstrated by how much you devolve the decision making to others um, and don't hold it all to yourself. Uh, that is a, a big ask uh, for uh, folks sometimes, or it can feel like a big ask if that has not been, as you've said, the, the way that they have traditionally um, held those positions, or if that has not been um, the culture of the organisation that they have risen in. Um, and as we know, uh, leadership from the top can dictate in large measure behaviours uh, at various stages down an organisation. And if you see a leader um, at the top and you want that role eventually and their way of doing it is to hold everything to themselves, then you understandably think that that's the way that you'll get promoted to. So there are big, big changes here and big asks that we're making of people. But we have, I believe, inside uh, our local authorities, inside our health boards and in uh, our chief officers, individuals who are demonstrating a different approach to leadership that is producing 
results in terms of the, the improvement in uh, care and service to those that they are seeking to work with, as well as an environment that people want to work in. Uh, and I think you get to a tipping point where um, that becomes the norm. Now, we're not at the tipping point yet, but part of the pro very practical propositions in here are all about leading us to that place where um, not, ha not working and leading that kind of culture becomes the outlier, um, at which point you, you take personal decisions, don't you? You either want to be on the bus or you think this isn't for me and I need to go somewhere else. But we're not there at this point yet. We need to move through the leadership, through some of the practical uh, propositions that are in this uh, review report, through some of that uh, uh, quality improvement support that we're talking about, move so we get more, we get a, a, a body right, of leaders in all three uh, partners. And actually in the independent sector and the third sector, uh, where uh, some of the leadership skills that we're uh, e seeking to emulate, we will find. Uh, so bringing, making sure that they are at the table uh, alongside everybody else. Um, Ms White mentioned the, the uh, third sector, but the independent sector is an important uh, part to play in this as well. And uh, already they are moving uh, to looking at learning some uh, uh, lessons and uh, ideas from the health service, for example, uh, some of the smaller, I'm sure you've heard it in uh, other committee sessions, some of our smaller uh, independent care providers uh, looking at working in clusters in order to share uh, some of the additional professional skills that they might need between uh, a number of smaller care providers that individually they would not be able to, uh, to deliver for themselves. All of that shared uh, learning and leadership will, I'm convinced, take us to where we need to be. Okay. Thanks, uh, Convener. I think, I think what's important uh, to, to um, be aware of is that integration is here to stay. I think, uh, I often think when there's um, a huge amount of change, people often who maybe are not convinced about the need for change often say, well, um, I'll, I'll wait a couple of years and, you know, we'll all go back to where we were. Um, I, think, um, I think that would be uh, fanciful thinking integration is absolutely here to stay and there's a reason for that of course it's because it makes sense um, I think uh, members of uh, this morning uh, Mr Coham and others have uh, referred to um, people discussing things in, in wards with social work and so I, th I think people have been doing integration in an informal way probably for a number of years um, I think what we're saying is actually when it works it works uh, and I think it's really important that people realise that, that there's not a door marked option B um, integration is it in terms of the delivery and successful outcomes for the people we all seek to serve, the integration of health and social care is crucial. Uh, shifting that balance of care is absolutely crucial because it will work, and it has worked in the past, and it can work uh, in the future. The other thing is in terms of uh, leadership and everybody in ensuring that they understand uh, what leadership is required, is that we shouldn't think that any, anybody, any one area uh, of all our, um, our, our stakeholders have a monopoly of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Um, be it the third sector, the voluntary sector, independent sector, health, local government, uh, from wherever those good ideas, we, we shouldn't be too, a good idea is a good idea. Uh, and if that delivers a better outcome for individuals, then it must be the way uh, to go. But I just stress this, integration is absolutely the way, to, uh, that we, and people need to understand that. We're not going backwards, we're going forwards, and indeed that's why this report has these challenging timescales, because it just sends out that strong signal between COSLA and government it's not only here to stay, but we're going to deliver these changes that are absolutely required in short order. Thanks. John Wood. Thank you. I think just in, in, in terms of a response to the question about how we get senior staff to work together, two points that I'd, that I'd add, and I guess uh, Councillor Curry and Cabinet Secretary are demonstrating a bit of this today, but the, the political leadership is, is also really important in, in getting senior staff to work in the collaborative way that, that we want them to, and that again operates at a national and at a local level. I think that the joint statement that was issued on the 26th of September last year, reiterating essentially the commitment to integration uh, was really useful. Leadership isn't just about an instruction, it's about constant reminder, reminders um, to a system that, that this is a direction that, we, that we're, that we're travelling in and, and, and a way in which we want to work. So that 
constant leadership at, at, at a national political level and at a local level in terms of the integrated joint boards taking on um, their, I guess, their identity as IGB members further is something that will really help. And then the second point, again, is just around the development um, of, of staff. And I think that Mr Cole Hamilton was absolutely right earlier to say that it's not about the calibre of staff, but there's a, there's a kind of side benefit to essentially bringing senior staff, um, bringing them up together through the ranks um, so that when, when they reach those senior positions, the, the, the clash of cultures perhaps isn't felt so strongly. And, and again, um, reminding ourselves that that's not just about local government and not just about the health service, but also senior managers in the third sector who we would hope to attract into, into senior public sector roles as well. Thank you very much. Fine, thanks. Thank you very much. Brian Whittle. Thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning to the panel. I think, um, I think we'd agree that sort of consistency of commitment towards uh, and delivery of, of integration is, is going to be key here in, in its ultimate success. And some of the, the evidence that, that, uh, that we have taken in here has shown a disparity between uh, IGBs and, and where they are along that process, and, and also some of the, their understanding of what that, that commitment is. And I wondered how the, you know, the Scottish Government are taking a lead here, perhaps, in, in, in ensuring that sort of consistency of commitment uh, across government departments uh, and in, in health and social care policies and legislation. There have been quite a number of um, sort of policies and, and ministerial statements all, uh, in uh, the, the health area. And I'm always struck by the fact that they seem to be quite light in, in mentioning the, the uh, sort of integration. I wonder where. Uh, the Scottish Government maybe uh, can be encouraged to take a lead here. So, uh, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Hotel. It's a very, it's a very good point. Um, if I can just add one thing to what was said previously, uh, one of the things I think, in addition to uh, what Mr. Wood said about the um, shared political commitment between COSLA and government on this, one of the things that I think people are beginning to appreciate is that across this Parliament, there is, regardless of political party a shared commitment to the integration of health and social care. And we will undoubtedly have disagreements from time to time <clears throat> about how quickly we're moving or how successfully we're moving. But I think it is striking that all political parties agree that this is the right thing to do. And the more that that message is received uh, in uh, all the various organisations charged with making a success uh, of integration, then the, the better, as Councillor Curry said, uh, there's no point in waiting on something else to come because that's just not going to happen. Um, but back to your point, I think it's a very good point. I think um, marginally in my defence, I might say if you gave me longer to speak, I'd get all those other things in as well. Um, but the presiding officer might have a view on that. I think he thinks I speak too long as it is. Um, <clears throat> what and and. I actually don't have anything else to say. I think you've you've made you've raised a really good point and one that I will reflect on as I uh, talk uh, in future occasions about um, issues that are focused inside our national health service in terms of how I think <clears throat> whatever it is that we're doing or dealing with will or will not contribute to this bigger piece of work, which is the integration of health and social care. I think it's a very important point. Uh, I should say, and, and uh, Mr Wright may want to um, uh, add something to this, that what we have said inside the Health Directorate is that every aspect of the Health Directorate now has a role in, a, in assisting in the delivery of uh, our part of this uh, review and the recommendations in that. So we're, we're looking actively at how we work inside government in terms of, first of all, the health directorate, but then reaching out to uh, my colleagues in other portfolios where there are clearly uh, connections in terms of uh, some of the work elsewhere, undertaken elsewhere by other cabinet secretaries. <clears throat> but as I think about some of the specific uh, measures that we're taking in terms of NHS in Scotland, the waiting times plan and so on, then we will reflect absolutely on the point that you're raising. I don't know if Mr Wright wants to say something about it. Yes, I think one of my roles in, in the leadership of, of the health directorate is, is to make integration front and centre. 
And, and actually, yeah. the Cabinet Secretary has spoken a lot about integration, about the importance of mental health, about the importance of the Waiting Times Improvement Programme. And actually, all of these things are, are linked. Uh, and it seems to be that getting integration right uh, and bringing together uh, health and social care, um, having more people cared for at home or in community settings, getting teams of people working uh, on the ground in, in people's communities and in people's homes, actually to create some of the space within the hospital environment in order to get the waiting times improvement plan yeah. driven yeah. through. And of course, all of these things, if we take you know mental health, these are aspects not just for the health service, but for local authorities and third and independent sector providers. Um, if we look at the public health reforms, if we look at the uh, GP contract, all of these things are interlinked uh, and, and actually integration is central to, to all of that. So certainly in my conversations within the health directorate and my conversations with uh, board chief executives, um, really putting integration right there and saying actually this is all of our responsibility to, to make this work. And coming back to the delivery plan that we're preparing, um, I would certainly want to make that front and centre of a number of the conversations I'm having with my uh, board chief executive colleagues as well as colleagues within Scottish Government. Can I, Sorry, Kavina, can I just add, uh, Mr Wright, uh, rightly touched on the, G the new GP contract, but of course all the work on primary care reform is, is central to uh, effective integration uh, because that is where the health service um, provides a more um, uh, integrated, if you like, primary care service and indeed before we came down um, Mr Wright and I were discussing what better use or increased use we could make uh, of the new paramedic provision which looks to deliver uh, uh, serious it's not acute care uh, but it is care that can be delivered at home and a response that can be delivered at home that is already proving to reduce the number of admittances to A&E uh, and then from A&E through, of course, into uh, a hospital bed. Now, that is not always clinically appropriate, but those paramedics are trained to a level where they can make those decisions, they can prescribe and they can deliver that care to an individual at home. The more we can make effective use of their skills and their numbers, and of course we're increasing their number to a thousand uh, additional uh, paramedics, then the more effective what the health service is providing uh, to integrated health and social care is in uh, getting that shift in the balance of care that Councillor Curry mentioned. Thank you. That was a rather fulsome answer. Thank you very much for that, <laughs> Secretary. If I, could, if I could take it on to probably into a more uh, practical area here. One of the key elements probably to underpin or definitely to underpin uh, the success of, of the delivery of, of the, this sort of integration will be a, a, an IT system that, uh, that, 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 that speaks, to, speaks to everything. And, and as we currently know, um, you know, as we've heard evidence as well within the, the uh, Health and Support Committee, the IT systems um, they don't speak to health board to health board as it currently stands. In fact, within certain health boards, uh, uh, the, the IT systems that, that collaboration is problematic, and they were lay, layering, you know, a, a local authority uh, on top of that. What, what work is being done to ensure that that, that sort of the operational plans uh, are, are are being properly integrated within an, an IT system that, that that will that will speak nationally? So, uh, I think Mr. Wright wants to deal with that. Yes, I'll, I'll maybe start and I'll ask uh, Alison Taylor to, to come in. It, it, it seems to me that the Scottish Government's digital strategy and the importance of that is another one of these building blocks that we absolutely need to improve the digital infrastructure that allows local authorities and health boards to share data in a way that meets all the requirements of the Data Protection Act and patient confidentiality and, and, and all of that. Um, so 
the health service nationally is working to see that if we can really drive through that the, these new digital platforms i think the information sharing with local authorities is of pivotal importance and doing that in a, in a confidential way that meets the requirements of the law but maybe alison you want, might want to say more about that uh, thank you malcolm just a few words more um yes i think the, di the digital strategy is obviously the, the main vehicle for, for addressing this and it is hugely important when i'm out and about people mention it to me all the time as well people who are dealing with patients and service users, the importance of being able to access the right information readily on the ground. I, I guess it covers three points. Malcolm has mentioned them broadly. Interoperability between systems, making sure the equipment itself is, is up to date and appropriate, and the, the critical issue of information sharing. And we've made great strides on that last point, I think, in the last few years. I think the other thing that's pleasing from an integration perspective, if you like, about the work on the digital strategy is that the governance is shared with the NHS, central government and, and local government. So there is a, an integrated approach to overseeing the work, which I think probably gives it a very good grounding from which to make progress. We just very quick. So we have a, a, a we have a strategy here to to to, uh, to integrate our IT system that allows for that the integration uh, within um, uh, the IGBs. Is that costed out? Do we have a cost? Do we have an end, uh, an end product with a, with a cost uh, element to that? So, uh, my understanding, and uh, my colleagues will correct me if, if I'm wrong on this, is that what what we have is we have a piece of work underway, uh, which is looking in terms of of uh, NHS Scotland how well its systems are integrated with each other, uh, and the information can be exchanged. And alongside that is running, uh, in partnership with it, uh, a piece of work that looks at how we can make that work uh, for integration so that information is exchanged. That, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're, what we're going to do is create a brand new um, uh, IT system that everybody plays into. What we need to do is make sure that the existing IT systems can actually talk to each other in the in the areas where we need them to talk to each other. Uh, and yeah, so I'm glad I got that bit right. Um, and so there will be elements of cost. So we can, we can go and have a look at that and uh, make sure that you have that information in terms of, of our bit of the government's digital strategy uh, and uh, the work that we're doing uh, with COSLA on that. I don't know if uh, Mr Wood or Council Carey want to add to it. I guess the only thing to add is that there is the Digital Health and Care Strategic Portfolio Board, which is a group of senior officers um, overseeing the implementation of the Digital Health and Care Strategy, which is co-signed by COSLA. So that's that's a focus for, for a lot of the activity there. Um, and uh, and from the local government side, we've got a local government digital office situated within the Improvement Service as well, who are the kind of interface with um, with the NHS on, on this building a, a single platform um, is, is one of the tasks that, that they're exploring at the moment. So th there's work underway, but uh, again, I think it's it's another area of work where we need to continue to encourage encourage pace. Take David Stewart on information sharing, and then I'll come back to Sandra White on, on other planning. Um, thank you very much, Convener. C can I focus specifically on data sharing? Like many members have chaired a number of conferences recently on that very subject, and as one wit in the audience said, data sharing is a bit like world peace. We all want it, but it doesn't always happen in practice. Um, could I ask specifically about what steps the Scottish Government and COSLA have taken to look at national solutions as recommended by Audit Scotland? Um, it's, it's part of the um, implementation plan um, and it's certainly something that the, uh, that the leadership group will be looking at and, and taking, um, will be taking reports on. I think as well that um, when we talk about information sharing, it's not just necessarily within the integration space that, that that's important. There are separate bits of work in community justice across public health as well, where the conversation about data sharing uh, comes up. And it's important to, to look across all of those bits of work uh, to ensure that when we talk about data sharing, it's not in a siloed manner. Okay. Alison Taylor. Thank you, convener. Um, the delivery plan, as Mr Wood says, touches upon the Audit Scotland recommendations for information sharing. I think there, there are several things that come into this. Um, there's the actual sharing of data between health boards, local authorities and IJBs, which allows us to build up 
the resource of data that then supports effective forward planning for services. And there are information sharing protocols in place now around the country to enable that to happen, which allows support from National Services Scotland to all of that effort of planning work. So that's one important part of it. Um, another aspect of it, which uh, has been touched upon already several times today, is of course um, that effectiveness varies around the country. And one of the things that the Chief Officers have agreed to do with us is to make sure that the effectiveness of information sharing within a partnership area is something on which they exchange good practice and understand from one another why some of them are able to do it much more effectively than others. And that, I think, also leads into the, the question about um, making sure that we effectively share good practice in a broader sense and have a broader understanding of what good looks like on the ground. Mm -hmm. So I think it touches on several points. I think um, so you can be, I think you made a good point earlier when you said it's important that there's a consistency in uh, integration authorities' data so you can make comparisons across Scotland. Is that something um, that you've pushed quite strongly from, from the centre to make sure that message is going out? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, what, what uh, we've asked the um, oversight group looking at the implementation plan to do is identify what they believe... Uh, would be the appropriate measures to measure success. Um, and we will then look at that, and the uh, ministerial uh, steering group will sign that off once uh, they've come back. But it's really, it's partly what I said uh, earlier in another answer, is we, we collect a lot of data uh, between us. Uh, that may be all we need. We simply need to triangulate it better. Uh, or indeed, there may be some of it that, that we don't need to collect, but there are other uh, measures that we should, or other areas of data that we should collect. So we've done it by uh, asking the uh, group charged with the implementation plan to identify what would be fair measures by which you would be able to look at how each of our integration authorities are doing uh, and uh, how we're doing overall, and then obviously be able Mm. to report to yourselves and to others. Mm. If I could... Sorry. So, so the meeting on the, on the 12th of February that was chaired by Sally Loudon and, and she and I are, are, are co-chairs of, of, of this group, we went through each of the items on, on the delivery plan and we, we had a discussion about, well, what's the outcome? What are we going to see differently as a, as a result of all of this? So the next iteration of the delivery plan will have that much more clearly. And then the important bit, well, how, how do we know that it's happening? What, what's the data that we can report through to the MSG to demonstrate that these changes are happening? So how we pull together that, that sort of data pack that we can um, you know, demonstrate that we're making these improvements and a lot of that data is or already there but we need to pull it together and secondly the point about how we use data locally for improvement uh, and back to what the cabinet secretary was saying about improvement methodology being really important here and then also about the sharing of, of data for individual people and individual communities so that um, GPs and social workers and nurses are, are working together and able to share information in a, in a confidential and, and legal manner. So there's a number of different levels to this. Thank you very much. David Stewart. Yeah. My next area of interest, perhaps more from Mr Carey and Mr Wood, is should integration authorities make their data publicly available? Well, I'll Stuart Curry. Well, I'll probably let Mr Wood deal with this first and then... Fair enough. John Wood. Um, so I think that performance data... Um, uh, is publicly available and, and rightly so for the purposes of um, local accountability so that communities and partners at a local level can understand what progress their, their integration authorities are making um, and, and, and that's a fundamental um, fundamental benefit and principle of health and social care integration is that is that um, is, is, is that element of local accountability um, and local transparency in terms of uh, performance and improve, improvements in performance th that can be reported through the annual report at a local level. So I think that it, it happens. Have you, uh, perhaps not now, you can perhaps mm. write to the committee. Have you any examples where integration authorities have made their data publicly available? Um, I, I can see Alison nodding um, to my left here, but but yes, absolutely. Um, and and I think that some of that was contained in the Audit Scotland report. Um, and if you want us, I think probably together with the Scottish Government, we can provide a little bit more on that. That would be helpful. Okay. 
Chair. Stuart Curry. Yeah, I, th I think in terms of the, the, the data being made publicly uh, available, if you're driving forward improvement, um, the, first of all, the, the, the data needs to be um, at the right level to ensure that people can understand that it makes a difference. Because if the data points to improvement, genuine improvement, then um, the, the public in a local area should see that. It shouldn't be, there shouldn't be data that says things are going really well, but the experience isn't uh, chiming with that. And if that is the case, then that would be a, a concern. In, ter in terms of accountability, it's really important. I think and we talked uh, and it's in the report about uh, engagement. And it's really, really important that engagement isn't a kind of a one-trick pony. Just you know, when something's going to close or there's going to be a major change, then there's engagement. That engagement needs to be an ongoing discussion with the public uh, in terms of the services that they're receiving from integration uh, joint boards. And of course, with that uh, comes the, the the data to ensure that we can see well actually there's the difference that's being made. Because frankly, you, there needs to be a base point by which you can say and measured against to say well actually things have got better. We can't just say, well, we think it's got better. We should be able to demonstrate, not just to um, the public, but to yourselves and many others, that things have got better, and here's why we can demonstrate it. Presumably when you say, if the data shows improvement, that should be shared. You don't mean to imply that if the data shows no improvement, that that should not be shared? No, but, but no, indeed, I don't. And, and the reason for that is because um, accountability and being held to account is, uh, isn't just for um, when things are going well. It's when things are going less well because then the responsibility is on uh, everyone to ensure that measures are put in place to improve. And then you can measure against that whether that improvement has been delivered or not. Yeah, my, my final point, perhaps to the Cabinet Secretary, but I welcome contributions from any of the panel, is Audit Scotland, which is obviously independent, had quite a colour line, which you'll be aware of, in their recent report. It said, and I quote, an inability or unwillingness to share information is slowing the pace of integration. And one example they gave was the inability in many cases of GP practices agreeing data sharing arrangements with their integrated integration authorities. Do you have any comments on that, Cabinet Secretary? So, um, as, as you will know, uh, GP practices are, for the most part, uh, the overwhelming majority, are independent uh, uh, businesses. Um, part of the work in primary care reform uh, uh, around the GP clusters and the additional investment that we're putting into primary care alongside the GP contract is to um, uh, help uh, our GP practitioners um, see the gains for proper data sharing to their practice as well as to their partners locally. Uh, and so that work is underway. We have uh, many GP practices who, where they don't have that concern around uh, information sharing, um, but uh, in others they, they do. And so it's not dissimilar to other areas of uh, health and social care integration where we have examples of where it is working well and other examples where it is working less well. And what we need to do is use the good examples to help the others uh, overcome some of the concerns that they might have. And the GP clusters is one uh, practical way that allows us uh, to be able to do that. So, so, so just in summary, the new GP contract is an important tool then in terms of data sharing? Well, the new GP contract is an important uh, tool for a, a large number uh, of improvements that uh, we and the BMA and GPs themselves uh, wanted to see in primary care, partly in the investment that we make to it and the, the uh, announcement I made last week about the uh, loan scheme that helps to de-risk GP practices is designed to encourage more particularly younger GPs, uh, often women GPs, to come into general practice without the, uh, the burden as they see it uh, of signing up to a partnership approach and the financial uh, concerns that that brings them. So there's a whole range of areas in which the GP contract uh, contributes positively to primary care reform, which itself is absolutely essential to effective health and social care integration. Thank you very much. Uh, Miles Briggs. Um, thank you, convener, and good morning um, to the panel. And can I welcome um, Malcolm Wright to his position um, today? Um, I wanted to ask some questions with regards to financial planning and reforms around that, because I think um, if the experience of integration has been anything, often the problems have come down to 
he who pays the piper, really, in delivering um, the reforms. So I wanted to ask, in terms of Audit Scotland's um, key messages, one of, this, one of the messages was the fact that financial planning is not integrated long-term or focused on providing the best outcomes for people who need support. So I wonder if the panel could outline, as things stand today, what level of debt do all the IJBs collectively have? Uh, I, I don't have the detail for each of the IJBs. I'm, I'm quite happy to provide it. I can tell you what their reserves are looking like, though. Um, and as you will know, uh, we have a number of IJBs with significant reserves, uh, around 23 million of which uh, is not earmarked for anything. So in the discussions around the budget, um, the draft budget, where 160 million is moving from uh, uh, the health budget to local government um, to provide additional investment in integrated health and social care, what Council, Councillor Curry and I have also discussed uh, are uh, the reserves, the position around reserves, and what would be a fair position uh, to expect uh, IJBs to have in terms of an overall percentage, and therefore what is our expectation on those level of reserves that are above that and how they might be using those to improve services, and equally uh, our position on what is, is known as set-aside uh, money. Uh, and uh, essentially what we are looking to achieve is a fairer balance in terms of financial decision making so that um, because of course the legislation is really clear and audit scotland report was really clear and that is where an ijb has delegated authority to deliver a service the decision around planning and commissioning of that service and consequently um, the financial planning for that service sits with the ijb that's the bit of governance it's crystal clear the delivery of the service that is then commissioned, of course, the accountability for that sits with whoever is delivering that service, whether that's a health board, whether it is independent sector, third sector, local authority, whoever it might be. Um, so that financial planning uh, should be integrated into uh, the overall commissioning, planning and commissioning that the IJB has responsibility for. Um, what we have uh, asked, and uh, either Mr Wood or Mr Wright will be able to give some detail in terms of what the implementation plan says, is what we expect to see uh, before the start of the next financial year by way of uh, individual IJB budgets and their planned use of those, which of course will also allow Councillor Curry and I to look and be sure that where additional resources have been given, then those additional resources are being uh, passed over to the IJB and used uh, for what we need it to be used for. I don't know. Mark, you yeah, can, I, can I come in on that? I mean, it, it, it seems to me that the, the report actually takes us forward with, it, with a number of fundamental things that need to happen in every integration authority across Scotland, working with the health board and, and with the local authority. And certainly my experience in working in, in health boards has, has shown me that there are variable levels of, say, financial um, transparency. And one of the pieces of work I was able to do in my time in Tayside was to work with the local authority chief executives, health board chief executive, the chief officers, just to get on the table what the financial position was in each of the IJBs, what the contributions were from each of the local authorities and what the contribution was from the health board. So th there's actually a transparency in that. And certainly in my experience in working in NHS Grampian, um, that, that, that was something that the, the four chief executives of that system uh, were, were able to put in place. So that, that piece about having a joint understanding of each other's financial positions, because we, we all know that public service finances are, are under you know, under challenge uh, right now. So having that transparency and, and uh, is really, really important. Um, secondly, about in, uh, agreeing the budgets and, uh, and actually, you know, trying to get better consistency that um, each of the integration authorities' budgets will be agreed by a particular point in the, in the year and certainly before the, the start of the, the new financial year. I think that's an important principle. And I think if um, 
NHS and local authorities are agreed as, as, as we are in the plan, that, then that's important. Then that helps us to, you know, if you put in place the, the leadership arrangements that we talk about and the relational issues, we put in place the delegation of the budgets on time, we put in place a joint understanding of everyone's financial position, then actually with the strategic planning commissioning arrangements, uh, that, that enables the set-aside arrangements to be implemented as, as per the, the the legislation, and then finally, it, it's it's really important that, that there's that not only transparency about the range of reserves that w we have, and we we can see where the reserves sit, and as the cabinet. Secretary has said um, what is designated, what what is what is not designated, but actually each of the integration authorities have a a, a policy about the the use of those reserves, and that policy is is, is open and transparent and, and known by all. So my sense is that if we can really focus on the leadership and the relational things, uh, and then I think all of these recommendations uh, deliver what Audit Scotland have been saying in in, in their report, uh, and I think this is a really important bunch of recommendations that we need to take forward um, and, and, and implement and we've now got work going on on each of those recommendations to make sure that we put them into practice. Thank you very much. Stuart Curry. Yeah, thanks Camille. I think in terms of uh, longer term financial planning what, what's crucial is that um, budgets in the past that have been set at different timescales for example I think have been um, I think it's been unhelpful and uh, we have local authorities setting their budgets uh, sometimes a few months before the health board so you have different offers coming in from different partners at different points and actually the report's very strong in that it talks about saying well actually there should be no reason and indeed i think with the the medium term financial framework there should be no reason why they can't converge and i think that has to happen because for an igb to successfully plan ahead not just for one year but multi years um, it has to be clear that um, here's the offer um, and we can use that in in, in this way and obviously uh, the, the report also talks about given sufficient support to finance and Section 95 officers who are involved directly in uh, the integrated joint boards, because that's quite important as well. Um, it can't just be something you do as part of another job. It has to be clear that you have a crucial role to play there, as you would with uh, a local authority or any other part of the public sector. So I think that's really uh, important. And in terms of reserves, I mean, I think it, what's important, is the, the report's not about saying, um, here's what the reserve should be or certain limits. What it says is that they should be appropriate. Uh, and that's about making sure that, we, that you know, I, IGBs, some IGBs you'll see from the Audit Scotland report have no reserves. Uh, some have, uh, some, some do have reserves, but it's about making sure that they're not being built up uh, for no reason. Um, because obviously the first question is, I'm sure, by memory, you look at a bar chart or a, a flow chart or whatever it is, and you look at a chart and you say, well, how come if that IGB has X amount of reserves, um, why is there issues uh, around finances? Um, so that's one of the questions that's there, but that is discussions and work that's ongoing and that's really important. But the longer term financial planning should be possible, and I think actually it has to be, uh, it has to be possible, because in terms of some of the services, some services and some change in services don't happen in a fortnight or a month or six months or even a year. They can take some years to roll out and get that full effect of the benefits for individuals. So it's important that people are able to plan ahead, not just six months or a year, but beyond that wherever possible. I think in terms of, um, I think that's useful what you said, and it'd be useful, I think, for the committee to also have sight of some of this data as well, which um, we've not in the past. One of, one of the things which I think we need to really look at is what this means on the ground. And uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned here in Edinburgh, well, you know, they've been using their reserves. Um, they've been looking at actually diving into set-aside budgets. This week, they'll be looking to make £19.4 million of cuts. Now, in terms of that IJB, I know from members who sit on it that they're seeing the, that this is actually undermining some of the integration work they've done in the past. Now, how we make that sustainable, and currently we're all agreeing, this is important um, to actually make it work, but it's how we move towards what will actually make proper financial management and sustainability uh, for our IJBs. And I think one of the things which I've raised with the former cabinet secretary was single budgeting, like they've looked to move towards in Northern Ireland, and actually regional planning as well of some of the integration, which doesn't seem to have happened and which Audit Scotland um, have looked towards uh, trying to suggest needs to happen. So I was wondering, in terms of the leadership teams and what we've heard today, how that actually is going to be taken forward? All of that, or any particular bit of it? Well, the, I think in terms of financing, it's absolutely key. 
in terms of IJBs, if they're going to be asked to actually make these changes in the future, the Audit Scotland report suggests £222 million worth of cuts, which collectively they're currently looking at making. That's impacting on how they deliver integration today. Of course, Audit Scotland wrote that report before uh, our draft budget commits an additional £160 million to integration. Um, and we are very clear that that £160 million, uh, is additional. It's not uh, substitutional in any respect. Uh, of course, uh, the decisions that a local authority then choose to make uh, are for that local authority and not decisions that I can directly intervene in. Uh, what we can do, uh, partly because uh, we have the advantage of being a relatively small country and a very strong shared political commitment between COSLA uh, and this government to make integration work, is look at individual uh, integration authorities and have the discussions with them uh, and with their uh, key partners that form that integration authority to try and understand why they feel they have to take the steps that they feel they have to take. Uh, uh, and at this point, uh, I am unconvinced that Edinburgh needs to take the steps that it believes it needs to take, either as a local authority uh, or, consequently, the knock-on effect to the integration authority. So um, we, we will pursue that. Um, Councillor Curry, of course, is absolutely right. The point about the medium-term financial framework was precisely to allow, amongst many other things uh, that it successfully did, is to allow that longer-term uh, financial planning. And uh, like you, I am uh, interested primarily in how all of this then delivers on the ground uh, to folks. Uh, but the uh, review uh, and its proposals are really clear on uh, the um, integrated finances and financial planning in terms of all the steps um, that Mr Wright set out and what re is required. And that is picked up in the implementation report. And in that uh, implementation work, of course, we are uh, looking uh, for Audit Scotland's involvement. I believe they already uh, are providing us with some assistance in that and with SIPFA in terms of, for example, what would be uh, a, a prudent uh, reserves policy uh, for a body to have. So all of that work is underway. Uh, my point about the additional uh, money currently in the draft budget uh, stands, I think. Uh, in, in terms of um, a regional approach um, on health and social care integration, of course, it would be a, a useful approach to look at taking for a number of uh, different areas of the service. Uh, my own view at this point is that we need to get uh, all of our different uh, health and social care partnerships operating in a more consistent, uh, outcome-focused way and some of the core measures that we would look to see uh, them delivering on and then look at whether or not there is room for additional regional working. And the reason for that is, is simple. I, I don't want folks eye off the ball uh, on the first of mm. uh, what we require and what this review requires, uh, whilst they go away and think about how they might work regionally. And I need them to work well locally and deliver well locally to this review's recommendations. And then there is absolutely, as there is in the health service, uh, uh, fairly consistent and effective regional planning, for example, for some important services. And again, you could see uh, some of that developing in time uh, for health and social care. Uh, before I bring Miles Briggs back in, <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned the additional 160 million. Now, the, my understanding of the budget stage one uh, provision is that it gives local authorities the flexibility uh, to offset their own adult social care provision by up to 2.2% of 2018-19 figures or up to 50 million across all authorities. Does that mean that potentially that 160 million in practice could look more like 110 million or somewhere between those two sums? Well, that is entirely a decision for local authorities. As far as I'm concerned, 160 million pounds is going from my budget in health to local authorities for additional provision in health and social integration. How local authorities make their decisions, it's a bit like the uh, car parking tax. It is entirely for them to decide whether or not they wish to use that flexibility. 
can ask Stuart Curry if he can cast any light on that at this stage. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but two issues. First, in terms of uh, set aside, I should say that the report is very strong that in order for integration to work uh, successfully and fully as we go forward, it's really important that the arrangements around set aside um, are implemented. It's not. It's not. It doesn't require legislation. The legislation is there. Helpfully, it's very clear. Um, but it just needs to be implemented on that basis. And actually, in terms of longer-term financial planning. Um, IGBs having the ability, uh, as they should do, to look ahead about how the use of that set aside uh, in order to transform fund. I mean, set asides are a strange uh, definition of, of, of what it is. It's a transformational fund. It's not a forever fund. It's about <coughs> shifting that balance of care, that 50% shifting that balance of care from the acute sector into uh, the communities. Now, in order for that to happen, there must be planning. It can't just happen overnight or even in one year. And that's why another aspect is that to say to IGBs, for example, potentially, um, you have to look at um, using your day-to-day -day funding uh, to try and transform services. That's not going to happen, because that would just result in either uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul or uh, overspends. But set aside is there to help resource uh, those sort of changes that are required. Now, those the benefit of those changes may take one or two years for the stagger to unwind. Uh, but I think it's absolutely crucial that set aside does work in that way to ensure that transformation can happen and the resources there. Uh, in terms of flexibility, well, I mean, the important thing about flexibility is about making decisions for better and the best outcomes. Uh, for example, children's services, uh, I think probably in all, if not uh, most of the IGBs, it's not a delegated uh, function. It's not a function that sits within the IGB from a local government point of view. And yet children's services, um, it, you, you know, uh, the investment in children's services can make a huge difference in terms of social care and related activities um, that are part of the IGBs uh, purview. So that's really important. And I think certainly colleagues I've spoken to in local government, that's what they're looking at in terms of potential around flexibilities. Some people are saying we're going to leave um, the, the, the potential flexibility where it is, but some are saying actually we can invest in areas that are aligned very closely uh, to the IGB services, and that's really important further down the line to make them sustainable. A mixed picture as far as you can tell yeah. at this stage. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Just to come back on that point, because you know one of the key aspects of integration finance which Audit Scotland looked towards was to commit for the Scottish Government to commit to continued additional pump priming funds to facilitate local priorities, new ways of working, um, which will actually progress integration. Now, um, the Cabinet Secretary um, doesn't have a figure of debt uh, today and will provide the committee that, but in terms of um, how we've seen health boards find themselves in difficulty and the Scottish Government's written off £150 million of health board debt. Are we not in a concerning position where some IJBs, and I know from my own here in Edinburgh, find and feel like they're sinking because they're constantly trying to um, make cuts or not be able to manage their overspends? So the vision we have and all support of actually moving isn't actually happening in some areas. Now, there are some IJBs, and Murray was one which was highlighted to us, which are managing that. But in the future, I don't want to see, and I don't think anyone around this table wants to see a situation where some IJBs are like some of the health boards with huge um, debt attached to them. So I wondered if what your view as a panel was on that and, and what the picture, we obviously don't have the figures today, what the picture is like, but what works preventing that occurring in the future? So, so in answer to the second part of your question, all of the work that my colleagues and I have described is the work that's underway right, to ensure under the medium-term financial framework, we shouldn't lose sight of these things. Uh, Mr. Whistle talked earlier about a very important question about how we present all of this uh, within the frame of integration. It is incumbent on all of us to join the dots in some of this stuff. And so the medium-term financial framework is a pretty important part of what underpins uh, our approach on the integration of health and social care, along with all the other elements that we talked about, and the work that is going on in order to get as clear a picture as we possibly can uh, about the financial position and the forward look of that financial position. But um, So I think that answers the second part of your question. We're not um, uh, complacent on, on this. Uh, health and social care integration, of course, will face all the challenges that public services in Scotland uh, face anyway. Um, and we need to look and see what we can do that's best for all of that. Um, however, um, one of the questions that always comes to my mind when I see uh, an integration authority 
uh, doing well, for example, on delayed discharge and another not, doing well in terms of managing its finances and another not, is what is that one doing that this one's not doing? Because the uh, share by which the funding is allocated, the requirements that are made are comparable, and I really don't accept that individuals, uh, the length and breadth of the country, are so different in their health and social care needs that it would account for significant differences. So that is why I said that one of the things we are fortunate in being able to do, but absolutely determined to do, is where we have integration authorities, and indeed, in some instances, uh, health boards, and let's not overstate matters, uh, where they appear to believe they are facing financial difficulties, is to go and have that conversation with them about exactly what is producing that financial difficulty, how are you using your resources, is the uh, support that's coming from health or from local authority what we would expect it to be, and if it's not, then it is Councillor Curry and my job to go and speak and see if we can improve that position. Uh, and that's the quite simply the approach we will take. And so the implementation plan, so that members are really clear, whilst it is the uh, oversight leadership group that is working on that and will continue on that six weekly basis to work on that, that work at the end of the day sits with Councillor Curry and I and where we see difficulties uh, for whatever reason, then we have a shared and agreed responsibility to act together to see if we can resolve those. Very much. Stuart Curry. Yeah, I, I should say, convener, I mean, I, I think um, when you look at the report and everything we've talked about this morning, it is about uh, making sure that services are not just deliverable but sustainable. I mean, you look at the demographic challenges, if you, if you looked at nothing else, everybody knows the demo demographic challenges um, that, that we face across uh, Scotland. It's absolutely crucial to put in place these measures now. I mean, we talked about set aside, that's exactly why it's such an important issue to transform our services to ensure we can sustain the level of services that, frankly, people have every right to expect in terms of health and social care. And in terms of the, the, the local government uh, budget settlement, 160 million is welcome, it is additional uh, funding. There are many, many challenges and there were many areas where uh, Cosland government uh, take a different view. Uh, but in health and social care, the additional funding is, isn't just welcome, it's crucial uh, in terms of delivery. And it's about things like, for example, school councillors uh, ensuring we can deliver the living wage in the independent and third sector. That builds capacity in terms of making it um, a, a good wage uh, for uh, a, a day's work. And as you'll, you'll know yourself, Mr Briggs, extending free personal care to under 65s is possible because of the additional funding within the draft budget in terms of health and social care. Um, and we just feel that's, that is to be welcomed and we should say that. You know, where, where there are things we don't welcome, I'm sure Cosa will not be shy and come forward and say uh, we don't welcome, but you know, the additional funding is going to make a huge difference in, 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 uh, across Scotland and to uh, your constituents and uh, the people we serve. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, David Stewart, briefly. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Convener. Can I just get back to Cabinet Secretary and the point um, that Cabinet Secretary was making around the funding formula and how Scotland's not that different? And I mean, I accept the generality of the points the Cabinet Secretary is making. Clearly, the strength of management must be a factor, um, and I, I do understand that. But could I perhaps just do a Hans Nan's point, as you would expect me to raise, as you well know, one of the reasons that authorities like Highland Health Board and Shetland, for example, have had real problems in requiring brokerage has been the whole issue of staff retention. And you will well know from studies that retention is much stronger in your teaching hospitals in Glasgow and in Edinburgh. And if I recall correctly, I was speaking to Shetland not so long ago, uh, where they're saying, I think for the first time ever, they require brokerage purely because of the costs of locum staff. And I think the Highland example I've given you before was locum consultants at 400,000 a year. Clearly, you can be the best manager in the world, and if you're paying out 400,000 for, uh, for locums, you're going to have real problems on the management. So do you accept that staff retention and recruitment, particularly for key occupations such as doctors and consultants, um, uh, is, is a real issue in rural areas? Uh, and, and, and would you like to... Uh, answer that question in the context also uh, of integration authorities and, and their requirements. Yes, I, yes, I will. Um, and uh, yes, I do. Um, and that is an area that uh, we uh, consistently look at. And for example, it is one of the reasons why we have the specific relocation package for GPs to try and encourage uh, recruitment and retention. 
uh, in uh, GP practices in rural areas alongside a number of other measures. Um, so it, it, I, I don't disagree with the point that you're making. Uh, I think that it is, has to be something that we are consistently looking to see what more we might be able to do to help in those areas where retention and therefore increased recruitment costs or increased locum costs uh, are an issue significantly more than it may be, uh, for example, in the central belt. And that does play to health and social care uh, integration, although what I have to say, uh, convener, on this is our biggest retention issue in terms of social care workers is the prospect of leaving the European Union, where um, uh, Scottish care have made it very clear that whilst we uh, know that overall across our social care workforce, uh, about five and a half, five point six percent are EU nationals. We have particular hotspots in health, but particularly in social care, where that number can rise to much closer to thirty percent. And of course, the prospect of losing uh, those individuals uh, in the uh, short. Uh, in the timescale of Brexit, which is not that far away, uh, is of considerable concern. And there is a limited uh, degree to which we can mitigate against that. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, paying the real living wage is a help. Some of the other work that we're looking at jointly, uh, ourselves and COSLA uh, and Scottish Care and others, uh, in terms of um, social care as a career option, with uh, additional training and support, the prospects of moving uh, inside social care uh, to other more enhanced roles and so on, uh, and some of the work that's underway on that uh, will assist anyway in terms of social care. But the real uh, uh, workforce challenge for us in social care is Brexit and the prospect of losing those uh, valuable EU workers. Indeed, indeed. Understood. And, and in that context, Cabinet Secretary, I wonder if you can provide us with an update on when you anticipate the Integrated Health and Social Care Workforce Plan uh, may be published. Well, that is still a, a discussion between uh, ourselves and our partners. Uh, we have uh, tried to take a little bit more time in order to build in uh, what we anticipate might be the difficulties uh, in terms of Brexit. That is... Uh, is not to make a political point, it is simply uh, a sensible point if you're planning the workforce and you anticipate losing, uh, it's a realistic prospect uh, to lose uh, some of that workforce or in the case of nursing, to see a, something like across the UK an 80% reduction in the number of EU nationals registering to come and nurse in the UK, then you should sensibly take account of that. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, again, uh, it's just a, a statement of fact. The position on Brexit remains remarkably fluid. Uh, so I would hope to be able to publish uh, that workforce plan uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. I have a final question in the area of governance, I, I think, for both uh, Councillor Curry and the Cabinet Secretary, and that is the Ministerial Steering Group uh, recommends that clear directions must be provided by IJBs to both health boards and local authorities. And my question is simply, uh, what implications the greater use of directions by integration authorities will have for the governance and accountability, both of local authorities uh, and of health boards? Well, I think one of the important things to say is that these are not directions in the sense that a minister gets to make directions. Um, uh, but they are um, about providing clarity about where decisions are taken. And we had a very useful discussion uh, in the uh, last ministerial steering group around the, this uh, report then in draft form uh, that uh, where uh, 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 functions have been delegated to the IJB, then that is the place where the decisions are taken uh, on planning and commissioning, for example, around uh, various areas of service. However, uh, if I... If I just talk about the health service, uh, the delivery uh, of uh, a primary care service, uh, for example, uh, the accountability for the delivery of that service to proper clinical and other standards sits with the health board. Uh, so th there is no uh, confusion on where accountability lies. Uh, so for a, 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 another example would be uh, nursing, uh, nursing care provision in a care setting. Uh, now, 
uh, the care provider is accountable for the quality of the service that they provide in return for the contract that they uh, have undertaken. But that individual nurse professional uh, has an accountability to her professional and regulatory body uh, for the work that she undertakes, as well as an accountability uh, in terms of uh, who is employing her to do that job. Uh, and those uh, dual accountabilities, if you like, in health have always been successfully uh, managed and, and understood. We simply need to be clear in terms of what the IJB's role is in making decisions uh, and then the uh, follow through uh, in terms of who is the provider of those services and their accountabilities. And I think the discussion we had and what the report says is very helpful in that regard. Thank you very much, Councillor Curry. Thank, thanks, Camina. I, I think, um, like everything else, it, it, it's important we're clear about uh, governance and who has the responsibility not only to make decisions, but who equally is accountable for ensuring those decisions uh, are delivered um, at the various levels. Uh, and just one example for uh, you, you know, it, it's come as a shock to many councillors, probably myself, that uh, what used to be called, well, I think it's still called Section 10 grants are no longer a decision of the local authority. Um, it's something that's been uh, delegated to the integrated joint, joint boards, and they make decisions based on a whole range of factors. Uh, not just in terms from a local authority point of view, but from a joint health and social care uh, point of view. Um, but but there, there still is that issue where, you know, um, a, a, a lunch club, for example, uh, funding may end for that lunch club. In the past, local councillors would be, well, well, we can just sort that out. But it's a decision, and we have to recognise it's a decision for the integrated joint board. But of course, making that decision in terms of the, the, the governance about that, a bit of accountability, is making sure that they can evidence why if there's either investment or disinvestment, why that is the case and how it will deliver a better outcome. And I think that is the, the key issue around governance and accountability. You don't just make a decision because you can. You make a decision because it will deliver absolutely better outcomes for individuals, for families, carers and communities. And if that isn't the outcome that we think is going to be arrived at, then it probably wasn't the best decision uh, to make and it's probably the wrong conversation so it does seem to me that we have to be crystal clear and that is a learning process um, you, you know and people sometimes get upset um, if uh, they think it's their decision but it's no longer their decision but actually the world has changed at the point I was saying earlier integration is here and it's here to stay and it's here for a purpose and that means that uh, people who had decision making responsibilities in the past that's gone and it's now a joint responsibility but with that comes accountability to deliver those better outcomes. Thank you very much, and I think that emphasis on outcomes is a positive note in which to uh, conclude this evidence session. Can I thank the witnesses uh, for their attendance and for their evidence uh, this morning? We'll now suspend for five minutes and resume in public session uh, in five minutes' time.
Thank you, colleagues. We will uh, resume again. Uh, the next item on our agenda is item five, which is consideration of two petitions. The first petition is PE 1611 in the name of Angela Hamilton on mental health services in Scotland. This petition was lodged on the 27th of July 2016. As detailed in today's public papers, members are aware of the previous work carried out by the committee on this petition. We agreed to consider it as part of our previous work in mental health. We wrote to Sir Harry Burns in his role as Chair of the Review of Targets and Indicators to make him aware of the petition and its request to reduce mental health waiting times. Members will also be aware of the recent commitment from the Scottish Government in its proposed budget. In a letter to the Committee on the 23rd of January, the Cabinet Secretary stated uh, that overall funding for mental health services will amount to £1.1 billion pounds in 2019-20. And of course, colleagues will, will note we are to undertake a, an inquiry into primary care this year, which will include consideration of mental health. Uh, in the light of these points and in the light of the fact that the petition is now uh, uh, some two and a half years old, I wonder if members ha have comments to make on this petition and in particular on whether it would be appropriate at this stage to close uh, this petition in order to focus on other aspects of the mental health agenda going forward. Can I invite any comments from colleagues? Uh, Sandra White. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Chair, and I uh, appreciate the amount of work that's went into the petition and through the Petitions Committee, having sat on the Petitions Committee previously, many many years ago, I think it would be. In light of what you have mentioned in regards to the Scottish Government and the you know, commitment to extra you know, resources, but also the age difference now in CAMS, which is one that was very important. But one of the most important things, I think, is the fact that we are looking into primary care inquiry. As this petition is three years old, I don't think it gets to that level of the inquiry that we would be looking to. So I would be minded to close the petition as it is, but also obviously include evidence from that petition into our inquiry, if that, if that was acceptable to the committee. Thank you very much. Uh, are there other colleagues? Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Mira. I think I'm mean, I, I sitting the petitions committee, and there is an increasing volume um, of petitions coming in that are um, very pertinent to, to this petition in terms of um, the men mental health element of them. Um, quite concerning, I have to say. And we are in the petitions committee are looking at how we can gather those separate petitions together into a, a, a wider piece of work. And I'm just wondering whether if you close this, peti this petition and put it to the side, there's a very good chance that quite a lot of those petitions will come to this committee. And you'll just be going over that, you know, you'll go over the ground again. So I, I don't know whether, whether we can suspend it or whether, we, whether, whether, whether you know, we have to do that, but there's a lot of work coming down the line in this, this area that uh, this petition, I think, still is pertinent to. Are there other comments? I mean, I think, in, uh, if I may respond to that, clearly, you're right, there will be an increasing volume of attention paid to these issues going forward, and, and as you say, uh, future petitions can be expected. Um, the question then is whether our scrutiny of policy in these areas should be based on those current and contemporary uh, petitions, uh, as opposed to the one that was submitted some time ago. Miles Briggs and then I'll... make a call. suggestion. I, I'm not aware of the numbers... Uh, Brian's suggesting in terms of um, mental health petitions, but if there's a chance for a petitions committee to group those and the issues which they're raising and for us to consider, maybe that would be useful instead of an acrimony. That's, that's exactly the work that we're, we're doing just now, is trying to get together the commonality between a lot of the different petitions and bring them together as a much bigger piece of work. Yep. And I, I, know, I think in inevitability that work will land on this committee. I have Alex Cole Hamilton and then Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, I, I endorse what um, Miles Briggs has just said, and I, I think it's important to recognise that you know, we are in a very dynamic landscape in terms of mental mm -hmm. health, and it's not necessarily an improving landscape. Um, and you know, the, the fact that this uh, petition has been in front of the committee for two and a half years, is that right? Um, I mean, that concerns me slightly because I think that the debate has moved on. Again, I think we're, we're backsliding in some areas on mental health around it. But I would uh, uphold the fact that, that 
you know, if we were to close this petition, it's not a reflection of the fact that we think this issue is sorted, but far from, uh, but recognise that there are um, developments within this area which we are going to receive representation from, from the Petitions Committee, um, which, which we should devote our attention to. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, I take on board uh, the comments, especially what Brian Whittle says about lots of petitions coming forward that are mental health related. And I think I'd be interested in a collaborative approach, looking at the evidence. I know that we now have, we have a mental health minister that has made announcements and commitments for um, spending money, especially for young people and children at school. So I'd be really interested in a, 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 maybe a broader approach as we go forward to look at, well, where are we when we scrutinise what has been announced and what will be delivered? Because there's a, a wide-ranging approach and mental health is really high on everyone's agenda right now. Thank you very much. Can I therefore suggest that we agree to close this petition, uh, we, but that we also draw that decision to the attention of the Petitions Committee, who will be considering how best to group petitions that, there, that are currently in front of them and may wish to take that into account. Is that agreed? Great. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the second petition before us today, which is PE1568, in the name of Catherine Hughes, on funding, access and promotion of the NHS Centre for Integrative Care. This petition was lodged on the 12th of May 2015. As detailed in today's public papers, members will be aware that we agreed, uh, the committee agreed, at its meeting on the 15th of November 2016, to invite the Scottish Health Council to give oral evidence on their general input and approach to consultations of the typing run in this case, as well as their involvement in classification of major service changes. Uh, more immediately, I wrote to the Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde on the 28th of November 2018 to request an update on the current position of the Integration Centre and whether any further changes to the service were anticipated. Members will have seen the response uh, from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde as part of today's paper, and in addition, a number of letters um, which have been received uh, uh, in, in support of the uh, original petition, uh, including from Elaine Smith, MSP, from the British Homeopathic Association, uh, and from uh, other, uh, uh, other concerned parties. Uh, can I invite, uh, including, of course, the petitioner herself, can I invite any comments from... Uh, colleagues about, uh, about this matter. Miles Briggs. Um, thank you, convener. And um, can I start by thanking the petitioners and the campaigners? Um, and you've already outlined um, the correspondence we've received. Um, Catherine Hughes and her mother are here today. Um, I know they've not been well over uh, winter, so it's good to see them here. Um, I think there's a lot of important work we still uh, need to try to take forward around this. I'm co co-chair of the cross-party group on chronic pain, and I know that in terms of Elaine Smith's correspondence, um, there are a number of issues um, ongoing with regards to the variation of treatment available um, across Scotland. And I think it's important, as the Friends have outlined, the Friends of the Centre for Integrative Care have outlined, um, that keeping the petition open would allow time for continuing correspondence and some investigations to take place. So I'd be reluctant to close uh, the petition and look towards um, how maybe as a cross-party uh, group, the work which we're undertaking, but also any work um, which the uh, committee, the health committee could also look at in this regard. Thank you very much. Brian Whittle and then... Just follow to what Miles Briggs was saying there. We, and I chair the, the cross-party group on M MSK and, and arthritis, and we do quite a lot of work with um, the, 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 the chronic pain uh, uh, cross-party group. And I, I, I again, you know, it's always seen time there's a bigger piece of work to be done here. There's a, there, there, I think there's, there's a much bigger uh, outcome possible here, um, and it's, it's how we fit that in, <laughs> and, and whether that's a, a, a cross-party group um, way in which we're, of dealing with it, or whether that's a health and sport committee group. But, but without question, there's a much bigger bit of work here uh, that we could do for sure. I think. Alice Cole Hamilton. Yeah, just to, uh, further to Mars Briggs and Brian Whittle's uh, remarks, unlike the last petition convener, this isn't being followed through petitions committee by a glut of other petitions of a similar nature. This is a, a standalone issue. I think to, I'm anxious about closing it now because it suggests that the issue is resolved. I'm not sure that we're there or anywhere near there at the moment. So I would just endorse uh, uh, Mars Briggs' recommendation that we retain it and keep it open. 
Do you have the, uh, Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, convener. As, as I reiterated earlier on, I mean, been involved in this particular area for about the last, I think, ten years, uh, along with others uh, as well. It really concerns me that 2015 this petition was put in, and it's just coming to the health committee now. Uh, that, that's a concern for me alone. Four years down the line, uh, there's so many issues you didn't raise throughout this. Uh, basically. Uh, one says that the patient is still open and somebody else says it's closed. I think we need evidence of exactly what is happening in, in the area, uh, basically. But like Brian Whittle, it's something which we were talking about health and social integration there earlier on in the evidence session. It's something which should be part of that, I think. So it's a much bigger issue. Uh, I don't know how we can move on with it, but Miles Briggs said you had that cross-party group, which I know about, and Dorothy Grace Elder had been involved in it also. Uh, perhaps it can be discussed there. So I'm pretty loath to close the petition at this moment in time, but I don't know where we can go forward with it, uh, because it isn't just about this now. It's not about this centre at Garton Naval. It's about a much bigger yeah. integration. They talk about uh, counselling and dietary service, well, surely that should be provided in every health authority. So I think it's a much, much bigger thing than that. I think for clarity, the petition was lodged in 2015. It was referred to this committee and evidence was taken by this committee in 2016. And then we pursued it last year as well. So it's not only arriving here for the first time, but we have a decision to take as to whether there is anything further this committee can add to the consideration of this specific matter uh, or not. Uh, I had Emma Harper and then David Stewart. Thank you, Convener. It's just a quick point that over the last couple of years as an MSP, I've attended many events, whether it's in constituency or in Parliament, related to pain management, myalgic encephalitis, fibromyalgia, different aspects which are related to this petition. My main focus is evidence-based approaches to delivery of best care, whether it's in the community or in health uh, service settings. Um, I am reluctant to just close the position without seeing that there's a resolution, but uh, I am interested in a way to make sure that we have a, a wider ability to look at all these other issues that are coming forward in the last couple of years as well. Thank you. Ed, thank you, Convener. I, like many, I also served in the Petitions Committee for a number of years, and could I just praise the work that Catherine Hughes has done in this petition, but also could just endorse to members the, I think, the very thorough letter that Elaine Smith has put out, albeit it was fairly 11th hour, but I think she made a very strong point about this, vital that the petition remains open so we can put patients first. Also, she did stress this was a Scotland's Scottish-wide problem, not just about a local area. So I, I would share the comments made by my other colleagues. Thank you very much. Brian Whittle. A very quick one to that. I mean, given, given the amount of work that's been done by various groups around this particular topic, there must be some way to pull that, that, that work together into something a little bit more cohesive. Because there's, there's not much point repeating some of the work that's already been done. So I, 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 would, I would look for this committee map perhaps not necessarily to do a great bit of investigation, but perhaps be a catalyst to, to, to pull together a lot of the work that's been done out there into something that's a bit more solid and cohesive. Miles Briggs, yeah, five minutes. For the record, yes, absolutely. In terms of um, the Scottish Government, they've outlined an advisory group who are meant to be undertaking work to look at some of the postcode lottery issues. So I think there's an opportunity. Um, that information's not been made available to the cross-party group. Um, I welcome the fact the Cabinet Secretary is going to come to our cross-party group um, to outline some of that. But I think there's an opportunity there um, to use what the petition was looking at to ask the Scottish Government what they're doing around this coming out of that advisory group because I think it's important um, I think for the petition's outcome to actually find out where the Centre for Integrative Care future sits um, and I think that would be useful and then um, for the petitioner to see um, if there's questions within uh, the petition we can take forward with the government as well. Very briefly Emma Harper. I will be very brief. It's just that I'm reminded that I attended an event last week about migraine, not last week, week before, and there's a postcode lottery attached to how do we support people with migraine. So it's along the same lines of a whole integrated approach that supports people across the whole of Scotland. 
Okay, I think it's quite clear that we do not wish as a committee to close this petition. We wish to maintain it. Uh, however, uh, I think it's important that rather than simply coming back to it again in a year's time and going, what's happened in the last 12 months, uh, we should, uh, I think, I, I, uh, two, uh, at least two cross-party groups with an interest in this matter have been mentioned. So I would suggest we write to these cross-party groups and say that the Health and Sport Committee is keen to understand what they can do to advance the issues raised here, report back to us, and then we can make a judgment on receipt of those replies as to what usefully we can add going forward. Is that agreed? If that is agreed, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, we will now move into private session. Uh, thank you very much.